So, so I, I think I got sort of punished because uh, I questioned why I got to give my talk first every other year before this. And then after I pointed that out to Chris, she says, well, we were just doing it in alphabetical order based on project titles. So this year we'll do it in reverse alphabetical order. <laughs> so, so I got to go last. All righty, there you go. Okay. Um, all right, so, uh, so this project has, uh, is a collaboration between our group and Matthew Harris's group. And uh, I like to acknowledge the people in our groups who've contributed data up front so I don't uh, run out of time or forget to do it at the end. So uh, in my group, and uh, it's great because uh, every year I get to add like a couple more people to the slides. So we've had a really great group of people um, so far who've uh, contributed uh, in important ways to the project. And so in my own lab, I've had um, a former postdoc, um, two really excellent technicians uh, and a graduate student and an undergraduate who've recently joined and started generating some data. And in the Harris group, um, Katrin uh, and Brent, and more recently, Joanna, have, um, have been working on, uh, on that um, part of the project. So our, um, uh, so our main task, uh, that uh, at least our initial main task that we wanted to accomplish in our project was to generate um, an anatomical uh, atlas of zebrafish, and I think the title said late skull development. And I actually um, found that a little bit ironic because one of the first things that we did when we started generating data was completely um, invalidate the late part of that. Um, well, I'll tell you about that in a, in a, a few minutes. But, um, Basically, we've, uh, we wanted to create a foundation based on the normal anatomy, uh, both in development and in the adult, uh, first, uh, to use as a foundation for comparison to other species and also comparison to uh, mutant phenotypes. And then eventually to build on that foundation to um, uh, integrate uh, data from our own groups and from other groups uh, on mutants where we have them available as we're generating them from other projects or they're being given to us um, by other groups. And also, uh, particularly with some of uh, Matthew's data to describe um, normal variation in anatomy in the skull in zebrafish. Um, and we've used primarily two uh, complementary techniques to generate this anatomical data. So in, um, in Matthew's case, uh, they've been doing really nice high resolution uh, micro CT. And initially we're generating uh, beautiful data on adults. And I could never get this movie to work properly, but um, he did at one point give me a movie showing rotation of the skull in three dimensions. Um, but he's already generated and posted on FaceSpace and published on um, nice uh, data showing variability in wild type skull anatomy. And this technique is really nicely suited to generate that kind of data because you can get a lot of detailed information from a large number of samples. Um, now it does have a, a drawback. Um, well, first of all, you, it's static, so you get one data point uh, per individual animal. Uh, it also has a limitation of, um, to get really nice detail, you need good calcification of the bone. And um, their group worked very hard to overcome that limitation by developing uh, contrast treatments and have really been able to push the limits back into earlier development and get nice detail from much smaller and younger samples than had previously been analyzed with micro CT. Um, and 
We've been sort of working from the other end of development and trying to push our technology into the middle to meet. And uh, we have been primarily doing um, low resolution confocal microscopy uh, using uh, a number of transgenes. Most of our um, sort of anatomical developmental data has been generated or we've relied on these two uh, transgenic lines. These are really our workhorses. They're um, extremely bright. Uh, the expression is maintained into adulthood. And um, in, uh, we can get expression in essentially all cartilage cells of GFP and in all, um, in all osteoblasts with the SP7M cherry line. And, um, because we're doing uh, confocal microscopy, of course, we can translate this into um, you know, three-dimensional reconstructions. Um, but also because we're, uh, we've been developing approaches to do this on live fish, we've been able to do a lot of what um, I call pseudo time lapses where we can image the same fish successively over a fairly long period of, a uh, fairly long developmental time period. And um, this is just one example of an individual fish showing uh, development um, from the very first appearance of the frontal bone, which is uh, pretty difficult to see in this small picture, um, but all the way through um, until um, yeah, I see your problem, Rich. You have to lean back to <laughs> So all the way through until you get to the point where um, the frontal bones are starting to overlap and form the interfrontal suture. And we can actually carry this imaging out a little bit farther and look at slightly later stages in skull development. And so um, this, uh, for us, has been tremendously informative to get this kind of dynamic developmental um, information. And it's something that uh, for all of the uh, wonderful uh, imaging that can be done in the mouse, it's still not feasible to do this kind of dynamic imaging during skull development. And so all these critical stages that are occurring when the mouse is still in utero are really not accessible to imaging in the same way that the fish is. Um, so, uh, um, we've taken some of this uh, confocal imaging data and generated three-dimensional uh, reconstructions. Um, and this is work that Osman in my lab has been doing. He sort of d has developed a nice pipeline for taking this data and turning it into these, um, these uh, reconstructions. And uh, he has made them into 3D PDFs, uh, which we uh, will be making available for distribution on the website. I think we haven't uh, quite gotten to that point yet. Um, but so um, users would be able to, uh, these are fairly manageable files that can run basically on anybody's computer. So users should be able to download these and um, you know, do with them what they will. Um, but in addition to being able to freely rotate the reconstructions, you can also, um, we have uh, um, annotated the structures and color coded them and you can make them either translucent or completely get rid of them to get a closer look at underlying structures. Um, so uh, we have done this now um, for wild type samples at several different developmental stages. We want to expand that to include um, some mutants, and we're in the process of, of working on that now. And we're also, um, because the Harris Lab has been able to push back the stage at which they can get useful micro CT data, um, we've actually been able now to do an integrated project where we carry out the confocal microscopy up until sort of the latest stage where we can get useful data and then we fix the fish and hand it off to them and they do the micro CT. And so we're actually, um, Osman's been working also on uh, integration of those two sets of data into a single model, um, which I initially thought was going to be 
trivial turned out to be pretty complicated because this data is generated in completely different ways. Um, but he persevered and has um, done a, a really nice job of that. Um, and uh, we're also um, trying to integrate our data in other ways. Um, oh, sorry, so I'm gonna, um, yeah, so, uh, so I wanted to uh, spend some time, uh, so you know, some of this is review, you guys have seen some of this data over the last couple of years when I've given these talks. So I wanted to try to emphasize uh, things that we're doing moving forward, uh, ways in which this data has changed our thinking about skull development and hopefully can change uh, the community's thinking in certain ways. And um, so one thing that struck me uh, very shortly after we started doing the confocal imaging was how early we could see the beginnings of frontal bone formation and also the uh, re close relationship of those cells to the cartilage that is sort of forming the scaffold for the skull at this point. And um, so that's why I said I kind of you know, managed to invalidate the, the late skull development part of our project title almost at the beginning of data collection. Um, and I just wanna say a word about staging. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated, I guess, for us than for mouse people. Um, so I know there's some variability in mouse uh, prenatal development, um, but not, I think, not nearly as much as we see in zebrafish during these early stages. And so we try to be, I may forget sometimes, but we try to be consistent in our use of um, standard length as a staging criteria because these days, uh, depending on the, um, the uh, you know, sort of the amount of food and the availability of space and, and temperature and things like that, the development can actually be quite variable and spread out over a pretty long uh, period of time. So I'll try to use both. Um, I apologize if I forget sometimes. Uh, in any case, uh, we see the first appearance of cells that contribute to the frontal bone, um, uh, in this case at 19 days post-fertilization. We can actually see it several days earlier in some of our fish. And uh, the cells first appear in very close approximation to this cartilage element. And then um, they kind of hang out there for a while as a cluster of cells that are very closely associated with the cartilage and eventually um, almost completely encircle it uh, before they really start expanding um, laterally to you know, sort of form a more typical structure that we think of as the frontal bone. So, I mean, I was certainly quite surprised when I saw some of this data and um, that, data together with other observations that we made about normal growth of the skull bones um, sort of uh, helped me at least put a framework together to think about the cellular events that are taking place during this time period. And so now when I am you know, analyzing mutants that uh, have abnormal skull development, I'm uh, really kind of compartmentalizing the events into these three phases. And especially, um, uh, you know, thinking about this uh, phase, the fir earliest phase of initiation of the frontal bones. And, you know, we really had not anticipated that the, that the, um, the bones would look like that at the earliest stages. Uh, so, uh, as I was going to say, another area where, uh, where our data is uh, intersecting nicely with the micro-CT data that the Harris Lab is generating, and now also starting to bring in um, mutants that are relevant to human disease. We uh, started a while ago uh, analyzing uh, mutations in the collagen 1 alpha 1 A gene. So um, this is a mutant that um, I actually found quite a while ago, so I've had it in the lab for a few years now. 
And it is a very good genetic and um, phenotypic model for human osteogenesis imperfecta. And uh, we had started doing um, confocal imaging on development of the skull bones in this fish. And um, I've shown some of this data before, so I won't really talk about it now, but um, uh, at least some of this has also been deposited on face space. Um, and uh, around the time that we were sort of finishing up this confocal imaging, we started talking to the Harris group about combining this with micro CT data. And uh, also, um, uh, reciprocally getting from them several additional collagen or mutations in either collagen genes or collagen processing genes that um, vary somewhat in severity of phenotype. And so we've been getting their mutants and crossing them into our transgenic line and doing similar confocal imaging on those and then handing them off to have the micro CTs done. So that uh, project is still in progress, uh, but hopefully in the next several months we will get um, a fair amount of data from these different collagen mutants um, up onto the website. Um, but also, around this same time, uh, we have both been involved in another collaborative project from uh, the uh, Willert group, and they uh, um, basically had wanted to carry out a detailed analysis of a number of zebrafish collagenopathies. And so the genes are all listed here. You probably can only uh, read a couple of them. But basically, these are, again, mutations in either the type 1 collagen genes themselves or in um, genes encoding processing enzymes. And they uh, wanted to look at variability in the phenotypes and uh, do analyze um, them in enough detail to compare these to human collagenopathies. And so they've put together a very nice study on this, which is um, in review right now. And uh, this is just uh, an example of data that uh, the Harris Lab contributed uh, doing micro CT analysis on several of these mutants. And, um, you know, being able to use this to get quantitative data about the thickness of the bone and the size of different uh, features in the, in the adult skull. Okay, so um, I just want to spend the last few minutes here talking about uh, another new data set that we've started collecting, and um, I'm pretty excited about this. I think it'll give us some interesting insight um, that is, I would say, the sparse in the field in general. Um, so just to introduce the motivation for this, this is a, a mutant that we've been working on now for a while that we uh, generated from another project. And we've been doing uh, the live confocal imaging on this. We call this mutant Toth. And I'm not going to give too much detail about the development of Toth. It's got a pretty interesting phenotype. Um, but we uh, could identify the mutants fairly easily at later stages. But we were really struggling to look at the earlier development of the phenotype. And um, by uh, just sheer perseverance, uh, my technician, Ali, just spent hours in the microscope looking at uh, hundreds of larvae and finally managed to pick out very subtle early phenotypes so she could sort some of these mutants out. And we could do early um, imaging to try to figure out when this very dramatic defect in the skull bone development was first established. And um, before I go off of this slide to show you the early phenotype, I just want to point out here, um, the, in the frontal bones, uh, well, actually all of the bones have this kind of spongy appearance with holes. And a while ago, we had done some histology and shown that those holes are basically full of osteoclasts. And um, so 
we realized at that point that we knew basically nothing about when and where osteoclasts are localized during skull development in zebrafish or, in fact, in most other developing uh, vertebrates. Um, but so uh, by sorting out the mutants very early and looking in more detail, we could see that the frontal bones are initiated at about the right time in the mutants, but pretty quickly they show a dramatic difference um, with, the, um, with the wild type siblings. And uh, um, Allie has sorted out some uh, mutants and done uh, trap staining to look at osteoclast in fixed samples because we wanted to try to figure out when these osteoclasts are first showing up in the skull. And um, I'm not going to show you too much of that data, but I just wanted to show you this really um, sort of dramatic picture here. Uh, all of that, those clusters of purple staining cells there um, are the trap positive cells. And in a wild type fish at the same stage, uh, there's basically nothing. So osteoclasts are not a normal feature um, in the skull at that stage in development. And there is a few other places in the skeleton where there seemed to be a huge excess of trap positive cells in the mutant, um, including here you can see uh, these cells basically lining the ribs, um, whereas you, you don't see really anything in the, in the wild types at the same stage. Um, but we also realized pretty quickly that this is a dynamic process, both in the mutants and in the wild type. And there were stages and locations where we did see a fair number of trap positive cells in wild type, and then a week later they'd be gone. Um, and around this time, we learned that, um, that uh, Joanna Lopez, working in the Harris group, had developed this really uh, wonderful marker, transgenic marker line for osteoclasts so, uh, based on the um, cathepsin K regulatory sequences. And so Kelly in my lab has started to do this kind of um, dynamic imaging in uh, living fish during early skull development. And these are just a few examples at about the first stage when she can start to see the osteoclast showing up in the skull. And these are, um, I didn't put the sizes or the ages on here, these are 15 days post-fertilization. So there's no um, skull, skull bone forming yet at these stages. Um, and one thing you could, she could see pretty quickly is that there aren't very many of these cells and they're pretty uh, variable from fish to fish. Um, and if you look a little bit later, again, you can see, so just for example, this is one uh, individual fish going from 22 days to 34 days. This is um, imaged from the ventral side. So um, you're looking at uh, you know, branchial arch derivatives in the jaw here. And so you know, within the same fish, the cells are in slightly different locations at different times, and here's uh, another fish looking at the side and another one looking at the dorsal side. Um, so she, uh, we've been trying to come up with a way to represent this data in a really useful way because there is a fair amount of variability. So what we're trying for now is to basically map the, uh, take a set of size matched um, fish and map the uh, osteoclast distributions onto a sort of common scaffold um, of the bone. And so you guys maybe can give me feedback of this, this way of looking at the data is uh, you know, useful and um, you know, we're trying to figure out a good way to represent this. But so basically, um, this is a nine millimeter skull, here's a 12 millimeter skull, and the there's three data from three different fish on each of these um, maps, and they're in different colors. So um, hopefully the people in the front at least will be able to see that. Um, and uh, just a couple things that I want to point out. So this is, we're still pretty early in this process. We haven't been able to do a lot of analysis yet, even in the wild type fish. But um, 
there, uh, I guess I would have naively predicted that in areas where you see a fair amount of bone remodeling, that there would be a requirement for osteoclast activity, and that's where you might expect to see a concentration of the cells during development. And at one level, that's true. So for example, um, you can see here and even more prominently at the later stage, this distribution along the edges. And that corresponds to the, um, the bony canal that forms around the, the lateral line nerve that runs along the side of the head. And so during the, these stages in skull development, the, there's actually a pretty dramatic remodeling of the bone to kind of come up and fold over the top of the nerve. Um, so you might have predicted that you would see a lot of osteoclasts there. But then um, this bone back here is the supraoccipital. And uh, honestly, I can't for the life of me figure out why there would be so many osteoclasts around that bone. <laughs> but at every stage so far we've imaged, there are uh, quite a few there. And, um, but yet in most other parts of the normal skull, you really don't see that many, see that many osteoclasts. So um, as I said, this is a, a work in progress and uh, these are just the sort of first early sets of data, but we're pretty excited about this. I think it will be informative, not just for us in the zebrafish field, but hopefully for other developmental model systems where there isn't a lot of data out there right now about the normal function of osteoclasts during skull development. Okay, so um, I think that, yep, that is my last slide, and uh, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Shane. Okay, we have Lichia. Uh, <laughs> let's see, just a second. <laughs> Do you see a very unique uh, distribution in the skull versus other, uh, other parts of the skeletal uh, structures in terms of osteoclast distribution? Have you already uh, compared? So, so we actually have almost not looked at all in the rest of the skeleton, I have to admit. And I think probably um, Joanna has looked a lot more than we have. Um, I can tell you, I found it kind of interesting just looking at the trap staining uh, that there were uh, periods of time, uh, this was true in the mutants and in the wild type, where you would see a large number of trap positive cells at one time period and then a week later when I, as far as I could tell, there shouldn't be that much difference, but they would all of a sudden just not be there anymore. And that, you know, you would see them somewhere else in the skeleton. So, um, I, so I think it's pretty dynamic, but again, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if they, yeah. if Joanna's looked in more detail. Have you addressed that? Hold on. Yeah, is there anything, any particular part of the skeleton you're interested in? Well, like uh, axial skeleton, for example, or Yeah, no, I mean, these cells are doing a little dance all through development. And so even in the adults, they're zooming in and out and like remodeling and reforming bone. So there's always a present in population on the like vertebral column and the arches um, in the, the radials of the pectoral fins, um, as well as within the fin rays. Like if, they're also there to, to help out with damage. So in regeneration processes, they have to clean up and actually remodel the wound sites so that can get regeneration. So, I mean, it really is a case for live imaging, because any static process you would do would be sort of artificial. Are gonna answer my <laughs> no, I have a separate question, which is gonna be the, the counter side to this. You're showing us about the osteoclasts over here, and, but you also told us that the mutants had all these holes, and you have probably have more osteoclasts which are there. What happens in terms of the osteoblasts? Do you have a RUNX2? 
uh, reporter or anything like that that would be maybe a better reporter for osteoblasts? Is there some sort of a balance between right. the two? Right. So, um, no, that's a great question. So we do have a uh, we do have a RUNX2 reporter line. So, so the data that I showed you there was the SP7 okay. um, reporter. Uh, we also have a RUNX2 reporter line, uh, which we ha are in the process of crossing into the mutants, but of course it takes like a couple generations. Um, yeah, so I think it, it, that would be a very interesting thing to look at because it, um, and you know, so we're hindered a little bit because we don't know for sure what the gene is yet. So I don't know if it's acting primarily in the osteoblasts or in the osteoclasts. So I don't know which way the signal's going, but if it's primarily an osteoclast-based phenotype, I'm surprised that we see that defect so early in frontal bone development. Like, I'm not sure I would have expected to see that. So, because, yeah, but. Anybody else? Okay, so that, okay. that was our meeting for the day. <laughs>